too. I know you can, John, don't, please. Because <laughs> we've been here for days as it is, what it feels like. It. <laughs> so if everybody has their drinks, raise your glasses to this, the fourth. Nice. Nice. To this, the fourth. Uh, listen, uh, could be recorded this bill. Oh, it's on. Uh, to this, the fourth. Listen, talk, rewrite session of the McProud Foundation. Uh, initially, it was PDC, but uh, the PDC found it was um, too much for them uh, to manage. So I took it over um, under the guise of the McProud Foundation. So thank you for coming. Uh, tell your friends, unless it's crap, in which case, tell your enemies. Uh, Salud. 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 Sphinx. Tutti That's Welsh. And it means, it's a very delicate meaning, it means up the arse of the English bastards. <laughs> right? Second toast, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, right. The English. No, Welsh. Welsh, Welsh, Welsh. Welsh, Welsh, Welsh. 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 <laughs> All right. I can't hear anybody. Can't hear you, buddy. Can't, can't hear anybody. Hear anybody. <laughs> we can hear you, though, John, so it's okay. I'm a German. Everybody hates us. So, Max Nix. So, <laughs> during this, please feel free to laugh or snort. Very good. <laughs> you did it on cue. Um, but uh, don't talk to me and Michelle as if we're like people you know. <laughs> Don't go, oh, that was good, Michelle, because that would be, um, what's the word, Bill? Stupid, that would be stupid. <laughs> I, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, that's stupid. So, um, shall we turn off our phones, ladies and gentlemen? Good call. Thank you. I said good call. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. A good one. <laughs> okay. All right. So, Bill, then. when you're ready, <laughs> he sat there for 10 minutes planning that gag. <laughs> Did it well. Oh, shit. It felt like it. Okay, Bill, take us on. The Boys Club, winner of the 53rd Annual John Gaston Memorial Playwriting Award. The Boys Club by Marjorie McNell. When I was a kid, I saw this old movie on late night TV. It was called Mr. Lucky. Cary Grant played this guy who runs a gambling ship and he thinks he knows all the angles, has all the luck. The story takes place during World War II, and our hero wants to avoid the draft. So he steals another man's identity. But that man is wanted by the mob. He tries to score big with a con and falls in love with his mark. When he tries to help her, he puts his life in danger again. Every time he sees an angle or tries to give himself a break, it all falls apart. See? He's not lucky at all, but he is resourceful, sort of like me. I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but Daddy snatched it out as fast as he could. Hawked it for booze, probably. He liked to play the piano and drink, not necessarily in that order. Granddad cut him off without a cent. When mom died, dad split and left me and my brother Jack alone. That's when I made my own luck. I got my brother into a program for talented kids at this local boys club, and they got him a scholarship. Got myself into city college and then into law school. I got a job in the public defender's office, then moved on to the lawyer's defense project where I thought I could do more good and maybe make a name for myself. Now, the man who founded that club is accused of murder. 14 murders to be exact. Each one committed on the 14th of the month, starting on Valentine's Day, which just also happens to be his birthday. 
His trial is being called the trial of the century. It has the potential to make the defense attorney as notorious as the accused. It's not a job that's gonna get you a reputation for nobility, but my boss is telling me I have to take it or find a new place to work. All the luck, right? Exceeding right and south. Hello, uh, you must be my attorney, Jill, oh. right? Jill um, uh, Bennett, Jill sure. Bennett. I'm, I'm glad you're here. I'm, I'm Randy Cooper, no, that's stupid. You're my <laughs> lawyer, right? You know who I am. These days, everybody knows who I am. I'm famous, or so maybe I should see infamous. Uh, let me no, help thank you. you. No, is, is the chair comfortable? I, I cleared the table for you. Um, it's, it's roomy, so I figured it would be the easiest place for you to work. There has to be a lot of paperwork involved in a murder trial, so I, I figured. But if, you, if you'd rather sit at the desk, I, I could, there's a lamp on the desk. It might be reading easier, or I could bring the lamp over. Mr. Clo I, Clooney, I'm perfectly all right as I am. I just want to get down to business. We don't have any time to waste. Oh, well. Um, well, let me say how glad I am that you're here. I had no idea <clears throat> who they're going to send to defend me. And you, you seem nice. That's, that's what I wanted. Someone nice. That's why I contacted the Lawyers Defense Project. You people care about what you do. And, uh, well, you hear stories about lawyers who work in the public defender's office. Just what stories do you hear? Oh. Well, um, sometimes they say the lawyers there aren't... Competent? Oh, this city's public defenders are extremely competent. They're overworked. So are all the attorneys at my firm, the Lawyer's Defense Project. You are very rich, Mr. Clooney. How much did you get from that trust fund you wrested away from your father? You don't have to worry about the competency of the public defender's office or me and the LDP. You can hire anyone you like. Yes. I have lots of cash. But who's going to take my case? Who will defend the monster who killed 40 boys? Mr. Clooney, there are plenty of lawyers who would kill to take your case. Defending a monster? Uh -huh. A great way to make a name for yourself. I understand that the hashtag kill Clooney currently has several million entries. Oh, that's comforting. Your situation does give you options. But what kind of name will a lawyer make for defending me? I'm sure I don't care. You should. You seem to have the job. <laughs> you think I want to be here? I'm here because I was ordered to come. Oh. I'm here because my boss says I'm low man on the totem pole. I can't say no. I'm, well, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to put you in an impossible position. You didn't put me here, Mr. Clooney. My boss did. It's embarrassing to be defending a man who had no trouble hiring the best lawyer money can buy. But I'm only assigned to you for the arraignment. The arraignment, okay? So here I am. You are entitled to a defense, Mr. Clooney. Now, are you planning to plead guilty? Does it matter? Matter? You're an intelligent man, Mr. Clooney. Don't play games with me. I'm not playing games. Awakened by the police at 3 a.m., dragged into court, held without bail, full of murder of 14 boys. My boys, members of my boys' club, my responsibility, abducted on my watch. Boys I knew and liked. That put an end to games. Mr. Clooney. Uh, I know what's going on out there. The guards bring me papers. I'm the architect of death. Because all the boys are found on sites run by my family's company. Every two-bit talking head on every cable station wants a speedy trial and a speedier execution. The media tried me. I'm guilty. Why not be plead guilty in court? The media is not the legal Don't system. Don't patronize me. I'm in a hell of a fix. I'm toxic, too vile, too defend, too rich for a public defender. So I went to my old college buddy, 
Greg Rossi, your boss. I made a million dollar donation and here you are. That's some story. There are a lot of lawyers Not who would... the kind of lawyer I need. Come on. O.J. Simpson was able to hire Johnny Cochran and F. Lee Bailey, Robert Shapiro, Alan Dershowitz, and Robert Kardashian. Shall I go? No, if I hire a who's who list of famous lawyers, I'm sunk. What? Sure. Maybe they get me a not guilty verdict, <laughs> but then I'm just another rich man who bought it. I'd always be the murderer who's walking around free because. Yeah, it's all beside the point anyway. What? What would you say my chances are going to be in front of a jury? In all honesty, not very good. So I ask you again, Miss Bennett, right? Yes, Jill Bennett. Now I ask you, Miss Jill Bennett, if I am already toast as the saying goes, already tried and convicted in the court of public opinion, what difference does it make how I plead? If you plead not guilty, you get a trial. The state has to show its evidence, bring witnesses, and prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. And you and your lawyer get to refute all that. If you plead guilty, there's no trial. It's straight to sentencing. Maybe we get to mitigate your sentence. Maybe could be life in prison or death. So I suggest that you Me hire- not guilty. It's the prudent thing to do. And I guess that tells me what you believe. <laughs> Whether I believe you to be guilty or innocent has no bearing. During the arraignment, the arraignment. I'm just- Who told you you were just here for the arraignment? The lawyer's defense project is for people who do not have any other access to a lawyer. People who, even the public defender's well, office, me. Uh, look, Mr. Clooney. No, you look, I don't have any other alternatives. The noble-minded lawyers don't consider me a cause. The rich man's lawyers can't exonerate me. The state won't give me a public defender, so what's left? I told my boss I'd only do the arraignment. I never signed on. I know, for the whole I know you're low on the totem pole, and... Here you are. Look, arraignment or trial, I adv advise you to plead not guilty. I came here to help prepare a professional defense, but if you decided to play the martyr, I'm leaving. I didn't come here to be a party to a court assisted suicide. Yeah. You're right. What? I'm not looking for a professional defense. <laughs> a professional defense will put me in the same place as pleading guilty, staring at life in prison or death. A reluctant professional defense is just no good. I need a spirited defense. Mounted by someone who believes in me and my innocence. And Miss Joe Bennett, you certainly don't. What? <laughs> So if you're only here because you couldn't find a way out or you thought you could hold your nose and speed, walk me through the arraignment and hurry back to the safety of your desk, why should I bother making a defense? I mean, why prolong the agony? Why not get the inevitable over with? It? You haven't given me a reason to believe in you. What? <laughs> From the moment I walked in here, you've been nervous, self-righteous and defensive. You've ranted and raved about the impossibility of your situation. You've been an outraged do-gooder, high-handed autocrat, an innocent victim in quick succession. But you haven't given me a single reason to believe that you're innocent. Would you believe me if I had given you a reason? What kind of question is that? I repeat, would you believe me if I tried to make you believe I was innocent? Oh, let me ask you a question in return. Do you know who I am? You're my attorney. No man on the totem ball of the lawyer's defense project. Well, you listen, that's something. Mm -hmm. You haven't answered my question. I'll get to it. Have patience. Humor me. Humor you. That's right. Well, I'm here to defend you, so humor me. There's a very good reason why I don't want to be here today. A reason that could...
put me in an impossible situation. And well, it would keep those 24 hour news TV news stations busy and hungry for a long time. Miss Bennett, I think? Uh, 10 years ago, a young woman, girl actually, walked into one of your uh, boys' clubs with her little brother in tow. She wanted to put him in an after school program. She was desperate but she couldn't pay your fees. So she wound up in your office begging for a scholarship. Remember her? Well, I've seen hundreds. You'll remember her little brother who played the piano brilliantly. In fact, he went to Juilliard and he played the piano at the White House when you received the Medal of Freedom for your work on behalf of America's youth. Oh my God, Jack Bennett. Oh, you're Jack Bennett's sister. You were such a stiff necked stubborn little thing. You're not a skinny kid in t-shirt and jeans now. Uh, I don't see what's so funny. No, it's not, it's not you, it's me. Stupid, self-centered jerk I am. If I paid the least bit of attention to you instead of wallowing in my own misery no wonder you're so pissed off i'm not pissed off oh yes you are <laughs> you are i don't blame you can cheer you back ramrod straight self-righteous just the way you used to be when we tried to make you see reason about your little brother oh, don't look at me like that you've really grown up and then lawyer i should have known you love them rules love them I'm glad you did so well. I was afraid you'd sacrifice yourself for your little brother. This is not about me. I asked you a direct question, guilty or not guilty? Well, you won't believe me, simply because I say I'm innocent. Who, who wouldn't claim innocence in my position? And if I were to insist I was guilty, could you really trust that? Wouldn't you be wondering just a little if I were overly dramatic? Suicidal, just plain crazy. You've already told me off for simply asking what's the point of pleading not guilty. And you were right, I was nervous, defensive, and more than a little self righteous. So, look at the facts, take a hard look at me, what you know about me, and what you'll discover by getting to know me better. Then decide for yourself if you think I'm capable of killing. Those boys. I'm not going to ask anyone, especially not my lawyer, believe in my guilt or innocence. They're going to have to discover the truth for themselves. That's fair, isn't it? Black out. Here's a beat. Lights back up from the south. Ah, oh. ah. Oh. oh, you. Oh, Why? You are the most infuriating man I have ever met. <laughs> How could you? This is a fight for your life, not a joke. Oh, you're telling me that, that was the most ridiculous. It was contempt of court at your own arraignment. Ah, come on. The judge needed to punish somebody. So he chose you. Did you see his face when he heard me say, not guilty? I don't think I've ever seen anyone so horrified. And Delighted at the same time. Delighted. Delighted. I just handed old Judge Collier his ticket to the big time. The most notorious serial killer for decades. And I plead not guilty. <gasps> he believes I'm guilty. He believes I should beg for forgiveness. Take my punishment. But then again, I bet he's already hired a publicist. I bet the district attorney has got one too. They're thrilled. Book deals. Maybe a career as on-air legal consultant, CNN, CNBC, even Fox News. But first, months and months of screen uh, time. That's no excuse. It's an arraignment, not a trial. You you stand there and you keep silent. I'm the lawyer. I answer for you. Uh -huh. I couldn't help myself. You said not guilty in his face. I just had to say something. Oh, that was contempt of court. I'm on trial for my life. Contempt of court, 
Don't scare me. But to say that. I simply told him the truth. Your Honor, it is not in your best interests for me to plead guilty. You caused an uproar. <laughs> if you want to get sympathy, look, you can't act like an arrogant prick. Even if I am an arrogant prick? Especially because you're an arrogant prick. Well, that tells me what I need to know. Shall I call the guard to come and let you out? Would you just shut up for once? Why? Shut up. I'm the last hope you have, Buster. You better not piss me off. You pissed off? Damn fucking straight. Swearing? Shame on you. Oh, God damn it! Shut the fuck up, shithead. Blasphemy, scatology, and fuckery in a single sentence. This will Joe Bennett breaks all the rules. Are you testing me? Oh, or is, or is this buyer's remorse? You know that fate, your fate, is in my hands. <laughs> you better watch it if you're gonna... If you're gonna lose your lawyer. But I'd known that all I had to do to get a lawyer was to make her angry. I would have done it sooner. Sit down. I mean it, get your butt in that chair. Starting now, you are going to behave or I walk and I might not come back. You're gonna sit there and cooperate. My patience isn't limitless. Got it? Yes, ma'am. Good. Good. Now, I've looked at the state's evidence, and you're right. It's circumstantial. No witnesses, no DNA. But what they have is compelling. We have, we have to find ways to make it look bad, starting with alibis. We have to show it, it would have been impossible for you to, to have committed any of those murders at the times that the state claims they happened. I was in and out of those clubs every day. I saw those boys. All the time. All we have to do is show you were somewhere else when they die. Oh, that's a wall. We go over every shred of evidence. Then you tell me what happened. Does this mean I have a lawyer? I don't have to prove myself to you. You're not. Does it? I spent all night reading. You might be being railroaded. So I'm innocent. You may be getting a raw deal. Sure. What? Someone else jumps on the fame train. What? Judge Collier, district attorney, Dalkatier, now do go to attorney Jill Bennett will discover the big jumps for fame and fortune is Randy Clinton. You were trying it at every turn. Look, I feel sorry for you. I hate to see when anyone is abandoned, but what I'm doing for you I do for a lost dog. Now, we start at the beginning. February 14th, two years ago, when the first boy was killed. Abducted. Abducted. Andrew O'Donnell was abducted. He died days later. His body was found at Clooney Construction's Foster Avenue site. They didn't break ground on that one until February 18th, four days later. Can you imagine? How many times he was beaten, begging for his life, crying, calling for his mother. I, I've seen it. Imagine. What it. were you doing on that night, uh, February 14th? Good Lord. It was all over the press, party at the downtown club, 400 people, mayor, three state, state reps, a state senator, biggest, our biggest donors, lots of boys, managers from the other clubs. All the TV stations covered it because that's when I announced I was taking the Clooney Clubs National. Quite an alibi. What time did the party end? I'd started about 5.30 and it was over around 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. Andrew was at his job until 9.30. He wasn't abducted until after the party ended. What did you do? After. Uh, do we have to go over this now? The arraignment only just ended. A discovery now. begins immediately after the arraignment. <laughs> it begins now. What did you do after the party? I went home, I showered, changed clothes, went out. Where? To a bar. With friends? No. I went alone. Anyone from the party want to come along? I didn't mention I was going to a bar. I didn't want anyone tagging along. Why? Because I didn't. Where'd you go? To a bar. Why don't you tell me where you went after the party? Because I went to the closet. That's why. 
closet. Yeah, the closet. It's a gay bar over on Simpson. They called it that so that folks could be seen coming out the closet. Ah, it's a joke. Why did you go there? You know why I went there. Maybe I do. I want to hear it from you. Well, I went there to meet someone. And then, well, I'll leave the rest to your imagination. To me, clubs, thunder meets someone at gay bar, takes him home, has sex, while one of his boys is being abducted. Did you? What? Have sex with him. Jill, I'd been having sex with him. He and I were involved. Oh, what's his name? What do you need that for? Do I have to warn you again? Look, if I tell you, I, I ruin, I ruin it all for him. His reputation, you know, he's a nice man. I care about him. It won't, won't do me any good anyway. His testimony could save your life. You really think that? You think the district attorney, the parents of those boys, the newspaper, TV, just going to give up because one man says he had sex with me while Andrew was being kidnapped and killed. After they get their jollies hearing about all the glory details, what's it all going to mean? What about all those other boys? I've got lots of nights to explain all right. away. All right, we'll move on. What were you doing when the next boy was taken? March 14th, right? I'll need everything. I need to know exactly who you were Last with. Thursday, what did you do? How many meetings did you attend? What time did you take your first call? Who was at the security desk when you walked into the city hall? What time were you due in court? Were you in court? What, what color was your paralegal's outfit? No, come on, don't hesitate. Mr. Clooney. Come on, tell me everything. Give me all the this details. This is ridiculous. Come on, Thursday is less than a week ago. You expect me to look back two years and tell you what color socks I put do on. Do you want to live? If you do, you'd better spend some time doing some serious remembering. Isn't there something else we can talk about? You won't like it any better. Should you? Tell me about the first victim. Tell, tell you about him? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Why are you making, why are you making this own damn top? Look, nearly 10,000 boys are in the cleaning clubs in this city. Four clubs across the river, two that just opened up state. I, I don't know how many kids I haven't been to the office. I wasn't, I wasn't being evasive about Andrew. Mm -hmm. Just oh, forgive it. Just hit me with the questions. I'll do my best. Did you know him, Andrew personally? Yes. No, not personally. What about any of the others? Well, no. Yes, I mean. I met some of them around the club or at functions, but I'm so busy running the clubs, I don't have time to work closely with the boys anymore. So there's nothing but their club membership to tie any of them to you. Uh, what, what do you mean? Most murders are crimes of passion. So if you didn't know these boys at all, it's just coincidence. You see what I mean? Jill. I do know these boys. You just I may not me. have met all of them, or worked with them, or had deep personal discussions with them, but I know them. All 14 were in the arts program that I set up. They, they didn't do sports, didn't hang out in the computer lab, surf the web, play video games. They had nowhere else where they could express themselves. I was just like them at their age. You're saying? So they're gay. No, no, that's not it, not at all. These are the boys with special talents. They didn't fit in at school, their parents, if they had parents, didn't understand them. I built, I built the cleaning clubs for them. Don't, don't you remember what it was like for your baby brother, Jack? Did he have many friends? Not really. There were a couple of girls who came around. Uh, that, exactly, boys shunned him. Called him fairy faggot. Some did, but my adolescence was a nightmare. My father, the great Patrick Clooney, self-made billionaire, was a man's man. Believed in 
heroes. I wanted his sons to be tough guys, the kind of men who live life like in movies. He did everything he could to see that each of us was brought up to live by his own rigid, narrow, impossible code. They got my brother Gary killed in Vietnam. It turned my brother John into the prize jerk that he is today. And me, well, it may not have made me a, a man's man the way Daddy wanted, but it had its effect. Anyway, I understood the boys. You know they were killed in alphabetical order, don't you? What? That, no, that's not true. I have oh, all yeah, your names here. The cops haven't noticed. Too busy congratulating themselves on getting me. The press too busy vilifying me, but I noticed. I pay attention because they are my boys. Randy, let's stick to. There was Andrew <laughs> O'Donnell, Ben Levin, Paul Whitten, Whittier, David Braun. Edward Jones, Frank Morton, George Ramirez, Hank Schultz, Isaac Mayer, Jamal Wilson, Kyle Patterson, Lowell Ritchie, Mark Axelwood, and Nathan Jackson. Only one was over 17 years old. None of them had a father present in the home or any friends until, until they came to my club. Well, I thought I was helping. I was giving them chances that they wouldn't have, but I, I killed them. As sure as if I was the one who. Oh, Randy, please. I killed them all in one place. See, I, I called attention to the differences. I did, I did it. I led them to that monster. You see, gay man. We started the club with the program for weird boys is responsible. For 14 days. It's my fault. I might as well pay for it. That would be justice, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Wacker. Well, here's a beat. Lights up on the cell again. A month later, Randy at the table piled with case files. He staples a sheet of paper to the back of a board and very carefully puts it into a box. Picks up a photo, looks at it. And the cell door opens and he shows the photo in his pocket, tiny. Still empty. Welcome back. What? If you had come a moment sooner, you'd have had quite a shot. I would? Yeah. Well, I think as long as you were answering a call of nature, I might as well do so. After all, I can't really, you know. In front of a lady, I mean. What? No, it wasn't that kind of call. A cell call. A cell call. Oh, really? Yes. Well, what could be so important on a Saturday? You need to get yourself a new lawyer. A what? You're quitting? Again? What did I do? No, time? I'm not quitting. You've been fired as a client. No more help from the Lawyer's Defense Project. I'm being taken off the case. What? People don't take it kindly when a serial killer who's worth millions buys himself a lawyer from an organization dedicated to helping the poor and downtrodden. Oh. That could be worse. How? Uh, I could have made a really big personal donation to your boss. You have a very strange sense <laughs> yeah, of Yeah, but it's funny. I can't believe you're not laughing. It wasn't that funny. What are you doing? Packing. Prosecution gets the files on Monday. Your new lawyer will have to petition to get them back, and you have to make sure that he asks for a continuance. Yeah, but He'll need all the time he can get for discovery. You're not particularly forthcoming. No, but I have my notes, of course, and the transcription of your testimony so far, but it's always better to hear for yourself. You get a better idea of what you're working with. I'm not going through all this again. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> You'll have to be a lot quicker about it this time. They won't want to push the trial back very far. I mean, he's going to have a job cut out for him. Him? Greg picked up a new lawyer for me? No. It's your job to find the new lawyer. He is just a figure of speech. I suppose you could look for another girl to take over. Uh, 
So you lost my me? boss said that he only put me on the case because you said you you'd even settle for a girl. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Did you or didn't you? Do we have to fight about this now? Did you or didn't you? I said I'd take anyone. I didn't say even if she's a girl. Why would it I? It doesn't matter. I'm through. Out of here today or I lose my job. You're kidding. Why? Haven't you been paying attention? The media got hold of your little stunt. Greg evidently forgot to tell his board that the LDP's latest donation came with strings attached. Our reputation has been dealt a serious blow. Your trust will get a check in the amount of your donation on Monday morning. <laughs> Don't you do something? Like what? Greg told me I'm through. So you're leaving? Just like that? <laughs> I need my job. Yeah? I am not to blame. What do you want me to do? Defend me. You can always get another job. Randy! Who will hire me if I quit to defend the most notorious killer in the history of this? Not proven. You win our case. You open your own practice. Infamous lawyers get just as much business as the famous ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I want to earn my living. All right. All right. Fine. I get the picture. I'll help you back. I never thought you'd give up that easily. You don't want to defend me. What? No, this is your easy way out. Oh. We're just following order. How dare you? Where is the shoe fit? Oh. Oh. Sometimes I think you deserve to die. God, I can't believe you've said that. It's a bit of shock. I thought you loved me. You are not an easy man to love. Well, he picks up the paper as well as Dylan's book, and he takes the photo from his pocket and slips it into a book. Look, I'm sorry. I never meant. Uh, this is way too serious. So much. I know. What are you going to do? No. Maybe I can get OJ's defense team. They were busy with TV gigs and book deals, but I could ask again. Those lawyers look like a challenge. They're pretty successful, too. I bet they could convince the jury I'm a nice guy. Can you stop joking for a minute? Sure. It would do me any good. Bill, isn't there any any way you could stay? Mm. I can pay you. And after the trial? <laughs> Look, I just can't afford to take the chance. Hey, you're single. You can't have many expenses. I have college loans. Mine and Jack's. You had a scholarship. I know. I helped arrange it. 10000 a year? But tuition was 40000 and you have to live in New York if you're at Juilliard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jackie Bennett's a big boy. He can support himself and pay his own damn student loans. Jazz pianists don't earn a lot of money. Even a well-received first solo album. So, your little brother's all grown up, but he's still dependent on you. It's not fair. So <laughs> Why do you care if it's fair or not? Or are you just trying to keep your lawyer? Yeah, of course I want to keep my lawyer. I'm going on trial for my life, but that has nothing to do with this. Your brother's old enough to stand in his own <laughs> Stop taking responsibility for him. Oh, and start taking responsibility for, for you? Yourself. I'm telling you this as a friend. Jill, you have to live your own life. Not your brother. You are not my friend. And I'm not yours. You know why I came here. Why I keep coming? Do you? I think you're going to tell me whether I want to hear it or not. Uh, my boss promised me a promotion and a raise. I need that money. Oh, shit. All the men got it a long time ago. I deserved it years ago. I left the public defender's office because I was just a girl there. I was in the same spot at the, at the lawyer's defense project. The only way I was going to get that raise was to come here and defend you. So I put up with you and your moods, your stubbornness, your infuriating little jokes. Really? Is that really? Are you staying? Yes. I don't believe you. <laughs> what do you know? What do you know about my life? You're this big shot. You've got a trust fund stuffed with millions. You can buy anything you want, even my 
boss. Your family never refused to help you because your fam because your father was a no good drunk. You know nothing about my fucking life. Why don't you just shut up? You think money buys you anything important? Father gave me that trust fund and then locked me out of the family business because he thought my being gay meant I was incapable of making a logical decision. My brothers, my half brothers, hated me because they thought my mother took their mother's place. Everybody has wanted to lynch me for years because a gay man would have only one reason for starting a boys' club. And we both know what that reason is. I'm an outside engineer, just like you. I understand exactly how you feel. I know exactly what it's like to spend your life with your nose pressed to the candy store window, knowing you'll never get through the door. I know I do. I can't afford to lose my job. Not now. I know. It's okay. No, it's not okay, but I have to walk away. I have no choice. Wait. Yes, you do. You got a hell of a choice. <laughs> I know just what you should do. What? Come work for me. For the Clooney clubs. <laughs> Are you crazy? How can I do how can I, I do anything of this before? It's so simple. I'll hire you as the club's chief council you'll be a one woman law department and your first project will be defending me are you nuts the Clooney club's board of directors would never allow that well they can complain they can stamp their well shot feet but they can't stop me can't they no they cannot i have a trust fund so i donate the annual payment from my trust fund currently six million dollars to the Clooney clubs out of that, I am paid an annual salary, and I get $750,000 per year to spend on any project I deem fit. Can you live on, say, 400000 a year? I could make it more, but I really should leave some money for the kids. Oh, wow. Uh, if you're worried the job will disappear if I'm convicted, I could sign you to a multiple year contract. Or I could set you up in your own law firm, Clooney Clubs be your first client, you can get others, and you wouldn't be dependent on me. I'd still pay you the 400000 How could I? I? Who'd want to work with me? Oh, after... you'd be surprised. Money can buy a lot of respectability. After a couple of Big donations to the right charities. People would forget. Besides, you're already on the outside looking in. Wouldn't life be a whole lot better if you knew you could buy the candy store? Not part of it. Anyway, 400,000 only goes so far. I have to think about this. Yeah, I think we won. Take until tomorrow. Gee, thanks. It's all the time I've gone. This stuff needs to go to the district attorney on Monday. We have to spend tomorrow completing discovery or packing up. Well, how can you be so so dispassionate? Uh, Don't you ever get frightened, nervous? I'm terrified. I'm considering taking hundreds of thousands of dollars away from my kids. I'm going to fight for my life. I don't want to die. You finally admit it. Mm -hmm. And I'm scared. I had to tell you that. Yeah, you did. I needed to know that you're capable of honest human emotions. It's hard to know sometimes. Do you think? You're welcome. And you'll do it? Will you come work for me? Continue to I'll defend think me? about it. I can think about it's it. It's a life changing decision. You said I could take till tomorrow. Would it help if I told you I've discovered something? Something that could help my case? What is it? Uh uh. This is my bargaining chip. I'll tell you tomorrow when and only when you tell me you're going to be my lawyer. Is it important? I think it might be. Then you can't withhold it, not if it's pertinent to your defense. 
Are you willing to say yes right now? I, I can't. I need time to think about all of this. And you'll have to wait until tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Hmm? Yes. 9 a.m.? Yes. Then you'll find out what I discovered tomorrow. When you tell if me. I tell you, I'll do it. Okay. Deal? Deal. Wipe out in the bank one. There'll be a brief intermission because I'm using lots of videos. Feel free to take a break, stay online, chat. Zoom in 15 minutes. Help yourself to perfect it. Yeah, come on in, Zoom Peter. Thank you.
Yeah, all right, let's go. We want to find out what happens. Now we find out if Bradley is or is not guilty. Yeah, don't tell him anything. And you know what? Just between us, I'm not going to tell you. What's the third don't possibility? That we don't find out. And whatever you do, don't take it off. All right. It's good to have a cheering section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't wait to find out this. The blue squirrel. They, we haven't come to the squirrel yet. Spoiler. Now, spoiler. <laughs> now everybody showed up. Okay. Everybody's here. Ready? Yes. I'm ready. Act two. You don't sit so long. I was always a competitive kid. Maybe I was born that way. Maybe it's in the family genes. After all, my granddad started out with nothing and built one of the largest fortunes in the country. Or maybe I just felt I had to prove that I could make it on my own. Hold on. Okay, yes. Uh, that I didn't need the rich Bennets, all those uncles and aunts and cousins living off the old man's cash. If they thought they were superior because they had made it, well, I'd show them. I was just as good as they were. Better. I'd be a success the best at whatever I chose to do. And someday, well, someday I'd be the rich and famous Bennett. Then see if I'd help them. Of course, I didn't know how I'd wind up rich and successful and, and find them in the gutter so I'd be able to ignore their cries for help. But that ridiculous hope fueled my dreams. I worked hard to make that dream come true. I was the little girl with straight A's, the Girl Scout who sold the most cookies. In high school, I was captain of the swim team, the yearbook editor, and the valedictorian. I was first in my class in law school. But whenever I did something, well, whenever I was the best, everyone said, you know why they gave it to her, don't you? She's a Bennett. Not once did they even consider that maybe I worked hard. Maybe I'd done it all on my own. Now here I am being offered the trial of the century and a job that pays a salary that ends in a whole lot of zeros. Fame and fortune all in one shot. What if I say yes? I wonder what everyone will say then. Well, yeah. Lights up in the cell. Randy is alone, waiting for Jill the next morning. He's looking at a photo he did earlier. Some block climbing. Randy slips the photo into a book and drops the book on the bedside table. Jill steps in. You took your time. It's 9.20. We said 9 a.m. It's Sunday. Sunday traffic. Took my time. Read the paper. You knew I'd be waiting. I wanted more time. Oh, I guess this was all a big mistake then. Well, <laughs> you know where the door is. <laughs> so the deal's off? I call Greg, tell him I'll be back at my desk first thing Monday. Maybe I'll go to the park. I could use a little R&R. &R. Well, it's a shame you don't want to know what I decided. Didn't you just tell me? I don't think so. Well, tell him. The guard, I'm going to need a phone immediately. Not only are you the most stubborn, conceited, infuriating man I've ever met, you're also the most stupid. Joe reaches for one of the boxes, breaks the seal, and starts pulling out files. What are you doing? We've got 24 hours, 24 more hours with these files, and I don't plan to waste another minute. You, you jump to conclusions. Now, didn't you have a discovery for me? So. You were just leading me on? It was fun. There was an accident on the 12th Street Bypass. Nothing to do but wait until the road was clear. Why didn't you say something? First of all, you never gave me a chance. Second, it was fun to see you sweat. Now, tell me what you found. It's in that box over there. 
one on the top. She'll go to the box and peers in. What am I looking for? Mark Axelrod's file. He was the last boy killed, right? No, he wasn't. Nate was the last one to die. Who? Nathan Jackson. Nate, that's what I, well, we called him the boys, I mean. Okay, here's the file. Now what? And there's a report in there. They did a DNA test on blood on Mark's shirt. I saw that. I mean, yeah, there was a lot of blood, but it was all Mark's. Not all of it. Not possible. I read that report. Did you read the last page? What? There's another page to that report. His mother's deposition is in there, right? Mm -hmm. There's something stapled to it at the back. It's a blank page. Flip it over, Jill. Who's SOBs? They didn't want me to see no, this. No, no, no. It's probably just a collating error. Collating error, my ass. No, you can't prove anything. And it doesn't matter anyway. Does it matter? <laughs> They're hiding evidence. Not very successfully. It's, it says not all the blood on that shirt was the victim's. I know. It also says that the second person's blood. The murderer's blood and your blood don't match. Well, it seems that I'm not the only one who's jumping to conclusions this morning. Where did that blood come from, if not from Mark's murder? Good question, Jill. And the district attorney is already working on a good answer. As long as we don't know whose blood is on that shirt, it doesn't matter what the answer the DA comes up with. Really? <laughs> Look at the facts. The boys' bodies were all found at Clooney construction sites, but nobody saw anything. Anyone could have put them there. You met the boys, knew the boys, or had access to them, but so did just about anyone who walked into a Clooney club. You have no motive to kill them outside the obvious one. What? That you're a perv. A perv? Harsh. Yes, it's harsh. <laughs> yeah. And that's why we're going to run with it. They want folks angry. They get them reacting with their guts, not their heads. With this report, all I can keep telling the jury that there is no forensic evidence to tie you to any of these crimes. But there is forensic evidence that ties someone else to one of the murders. And the DA has chosen to harass you rather than following up on this very real physical evidence. You think that's enough? <laughs> Don't you? First, the prosecution has forensic evidence that someone else is involved in one of the murders, and they're not pursuing that. Second, they have no forensic evidence that you were involved in any death. Third, they've been carrying on a smear campaign. Yeah, fine, fine. You can say all that. Yeah, but they all say the circumstantial evidence is overwhelming. They'll say, I could have had an accomplice, and the blood is his. They'll say they haven't said anything about me that hasn't already been said for years. But I found evidence essential to my case removed from a report and inserted into a deposition backwards where I was unlikely to find it. Can't say anybody hit it exactly. Can't get a mistrial. But that's what makes it so great. What are you talking about? I can hammer on this in court. The prosecution will object. <laughs> they will and the judge will sustain and we're back at square one no sure the judge will tell the jury to disregard my accusation but they won't forget and they can't disregard the evidence we have what we need reasonable doubt lots of it and we really work on the lack of dna evidence against you if you didn't kill one boy it's possible you didn't kill I any didn't. of I know. Really? Well, I'm here, aren't I, on a sunny Sunday morning when it's very nice in the park? Smart ass. <laughs> so how long have you known I'm in the sun? For a while. I figured you wouldn't be so irritatingly uncooperative if you had done it. Why's that? Innocent people are usually too angry that no one believes them to get scared until it's too late. And you get pretty angry. Where'd you come up with that theory? Oh, we're wasting time. Okay, <laughs> here's what we've got to do. First, 
We have to scour all these boxes for another missing DNA report. We can't have them waving a report under our nose, my nose, that says the blood belongs to Mark's little brother. And then have mom testify that Mark gave him a bloody nose the day he went missing. Do you think that's possible? Anything's possible. So we dig. We can't afford to look the least bit sloppy. There should be more blood. 14 murders and almost no blood. Surely somebody struggled, scratched something. We're, we're going to have to review all the reports. And then I'm going to want to put you on the stand. Oh, no, whoa, slow down. Wait a minute. What, what, what? Does this mean you're taking me out on my offer? Huh, what? Will you officially become my private defense attorney and later? Take out position as chief counsel for Clooney Clubs. I believe we talked about um, an annual salary of 400000 Oh, you've got a lot to no, do I here. Insist. I've even drawn up uh, a little contract. Uh, you can correct me if I did something illegal. I, Mandy Clooney, agreed to hire Jill Bennett in the position of chief counsel of Clooney Clubs, a not for profit organization chartered in this state, and to pay her the sum of four. 100,000 per annum in return. Jill Bennett will act as my defense attorney during the murder trial. Position of chief counsel will begin immediately following the end of the trial, regardless of the verdict. There. Sign me up. Isn't it legal? It's legal enough. Put you and John Hancock right there. Do we have to do this now? No time like the present. I don't need a signed contract. You gave me your word. Yeah, I could break it. I could leave. Okay. You can sign before you leave. Alrighty then. I, I want to start by interviewing you again. I, I want to go over your testimony with a fine tooth comb. I went rock solid on every detail. Why, why do I have to be rock solid on every detail? We have a DNA report with a mystery blood sample. I'm going to put you on the stand, and you're going to talk about it. I'm not getting on the stand. No, I, I can't sway the jury. I don't want to face the prosecution. Why? Because they'll make me angry, and I'll wind up saying something stupid. Oh, that's ridiculous. You're a smart man. You could see through a ploy like that. Yeah, maybe I can. But I don't want to take the risk. You want me to defend myself. I have no intention of doing that. No, anything. that's a lie. You have every intention of defending yourself. You always have. It's another one of your little games, and I'm not going to stand for I'm it anymore. Playing. You've been playing me from the beginning. But that's going to stop right now because it just doesn't work. Isn't it? Mm -mm. You're still here, aren't you? You think you're so smart. You th you think you have everything figured out. But I've seen your games before. I told you I have experience. Yeah? Then what took you so long? Who said it took so long? My instincts told me that they had the wrong guy as soon as I had a chance to look at the evidence. But well, I had to be sure. Not just that you were innocent but that there was a good chance I could get you off. Nice way to put it. That I could get a verdict of not guilty. And that's why you're going on the witness stand. You have got to show the jury who you are and how you feel about these kids. Mm -hmm. They have to see you the way I see it. I'll be in court. They can see me just fine. The way to win, the only way, is to counteract the innuendos. They have to see you for what you really are, a man who has dedicated his life to helping boys and who has suffered a lot to do it. There's only one person who can introduce them to that man. That's you. Me? I thought I was overbearing, infuriating, stubborn, impossible. Oh, shut up. I'm not, I'm not going to let them see that side of you. You're going to be the strong, dedicated, caring person I believe you to be under all the crap you keep shoveling at me. You are one irritating self, son of a bitch, but the jury doesn't need to know that. Facts and the truth are not always the same thing. 
facts demonstrate that you can be one hard man to like, the truth shows that you've done a wonderful thing for the boys of the city. So how do you want to be seen when we go into court? All right. On one condition. Can't you just be straight with me for a minute? No, I am I'm being straight. Just sign my little contract, Joe, and I'm all yours. Why is it so important to you that I sign this thing? I'm thinking of you. You're walking away from a good paying job with a career track. Yes, and career. I'm going to make sure that you don't lose out. So sign already. Let's get to work. I still figure you're just playing me. I'm opening the door to the candy store for you. Stop <laughs> pressing your nose up against the window. Walk through. It's the least I can do for the only person in the world who is on my side. The person who's going to save my life. Is that what you think I am? I know that's who you are. Now, sign. And even if things don't work out for me, they work out for you. I want that more than anything. Okay? Okay. You sign Blackout, the gavel, and a cell door. Weeks later, the cell is empty. Evidence boxes are gone, books shelved. One book for me. Doors swings open. Randy and Joe enter. Well, that was quite a show you put on today. Randy the noble. <laughs> Randy the selfless. Randy the morally outraged. <laughs> you sure know how to play to an audience. For simply following the orders of my counsel. Did I do wrong? No. No, you did exactly what I told you to do. I had no idea you'd be so good at it. I was just being myself. <laughs> then how come I never saw that side of you before? I've been very nice to you. You've been perfectly horrible. But you were perfectly wonderful on the witness stand today. It was all your doing. Really? Come on. Since the day we found that misplaced DNA report, hmm. you haven't missed a beat. You've been flawless. Yeah. How so? Well, first, you use my date book to demonstrate I have very strong alibis for over half the murders. You got my big brother, John, to admit that I was with him at a meeting of the Cleaney Trust very late into the evening of September 14th. John Wayne Clooney got angry, which didn't Wait, hurt. did you just call your brother John Wayne? Yep. Uh, and your oldest brother, Gary, the one who was killed in Vietnam? Could he be named? Gary Cooper. Oh, and that would make your middle name? Scott. <laughs> oh, God. John Wayne, Gary Cooper, and Randolph Scott? Oh, my God. Cowboy stars. You're all named after. <laughs> How could I not know this? Nobody knows it. Uh, Hiding our middle names is the only thing my brothers and I could ever agree on. Come on, partner, let's round up those ornery no good name callers. Marshal, I need these men arrested on account of they've been calling me by my name. It's, yeah, it's not that strong. <laughs> yes, it is. And it's so wonderfully ironic, too. I would think a woman <laughs> whose offspring, uh, whose parents named their offspring Jack and Jill, which are a little more <laughs> Nope. All compassion was beat out of me on the playground. Parents show absolutely no sense when it comes to naming their kids. But your father... I know. I know. You did a bang up job. Absolutely. He could have picked a better name for you if he tried, though. What? He couldn't have. Yeah, Randolph Scott. Tough, strong, noble, fearless, and gay. Um, very good. You can't take a compliment, can you? Compliment? I think I just called you tough, strong, noble, noble, and fearless. I learned about all that in these past few weeks. Seriously, you did a great job today. I called D.A. Doherty a son of a bitch. You did. 
Judge Collier threatened to hold me in contempt. On several occasions. And you called that a great job. You were perfect. Maybe the best part was that you never tried to make anyone like you. Of course, I don't know if you have it in you to make anyone like you, but your natural irascibility worked in your favor. You were the perfect hostile witness. You even refused to answer some of my questions. And you were smart enough to be involved. When you refused to name that nice man you met on your birthday, oh, it's obvious you were trying to protect him. Think so? That's why Joe Doherty was so tough on you. And you exploded. What did you shout at him? Oh, oh, oh. oh. Last Thursday, how many meetings did you go to? Who was at the security desk at City Hall? What time were you due in court? What outfit was your paralegal wearing? <laughs> Don't be glad that. Uh, yeah, you weren't so bad yourself. The uh, way you entered the DNA report into evidence, mm -hmm. they didn't know what hit them. Yeah. The couple was first on the scene when they found Mark's body. Tells you about the blood on the shirt, but you didn't ask him anything about the testing. Mm -hmm. And you surprised him by calling the technician <laughs> who performed the test. No, it wasn't a surprise. You sure acted surprised. And when you asked about the second blood sample, <gasps> that was great. First, he had to admit the blood wasn't mine. Mm -hmm. Then he had to say they didn't test it any further. You know that testing it further doesn't mean... I know, yeah. I'm sure they were more eager to name me can't than look for the truth. Right. Can't prove their motives. I can only insinuate. <laughs> I'm so glad I chose you. What did you say? No, I, 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 I mean, I'm glad you're my lawyer. You said you chose me. Chose you? Yes, chose. Well, chose me? No, it's a, it was a slip of the tongue. A Freudian slip, maybe? No, I just meant I was glad. I distinctly remember being told that no private defense attorney would take your case. I was ordered to show up here by my boss. My boss, your friend. You didn't know who I was when I walked in here. Or did you? Oh, wait a minute. It was all I just a big lie. Sure. No, no, just give me a minute to explain. I offered you the chance of a lifetime for 400,000. Why? Would I do that? Maybe Jill? you just wanted a patsy, someone you could manipulate. How have I manipulated? You got me to feel sorry for you, to believe in you, knew, to want to fight for Come you. Come on, I want a smart, stubborn, passionate, aggressive woman fighting for me. You see people lining up to help me. Bullshit. Right from the beginning, you've been working on me. Just like you worked on the DA. That little speech to him was exactly the one you told me when I started questioning, wasn't it? A handy dandy zinger are you gonna pull out now, huh? Come on, let's hear it. I haven't got one. Surely you can come up with one, one more bon mot for an emergency like this one, huh? You made me think that I was your one and last hope. You were my best hope. But that's not exactly the same thing, is it? No, what? it's not. What? What? You want the truth? All of it? Yes! Okay. I knew who you were when you walked in here. I, yeah, I saw your name on the list of attorneys that Greg Rossi gave me, and I remember thinking, so skinny little Jill Bennett's an attorney now. I always knew she had great Right. More like you thought, here's a chump I can take advantage of. <laughs> How have I taken advantage of you? I'm giving you a job that pays almost half a million dollars a year, and you can keep for as long as you like. I'm, come on, I'm being candid. Come on, the least you can do is this. So my okay. name jumped out at you. Yeah, I was surprised and impressed to see your name on the list. So I asked Greg for you. Just like that? Just like that. So why the big act when I walked in here that first day? Hi, I'm Randy, and who are you? How do you explain away that? Cold feet. You never had cold feet in your life. <laughs> that day, you walked in looking so defensive, so angry, so miserably unhappy that I immediately thought, Randy, what have you done? And it's, it's again now. I pretended not to know you, 
perhaps that you wouldn't think I, I brought you here? Mm. Nice try, but you're forgetting something. What? Your big performance. Randy, as the noble hero willing to sacrifice his life unless he found one person who would truly believe in him. When you came through, you find colors. Smarter, more inventive, more tenacious than I imagined you could be. Nobody could be better. Jill, if I had a daughter, I hope she'd be like you. If I have a best friend. I hope it, it is you. Can you, can you forgive me for being a stupid, manipulative, lying old queer? You can be, and Jill embraces you. Of course, I can, you stupid, manipulative, lying old queer. There are court sound effects. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, 14 boys were murdered right here in our city. 14 mothers mourn for the sons who will never marry, never have children of their own, never grow old. Some monster took pleasure in their suffering. Can you imagine that? Somewhere in our city is someone who takes pleasure in seeing young men die? Unfortunately, that person is not in this courtroom today. How do I know? For a number of reasons. First, Mr. Doherty has only proved circumstantial evidence. All the boys belong to Clooney clubs. Yes, there was ample opportunity for Mr. Clooney to be befriend the boys. Yes, all the boys were found on Clooney construction sites. Yes, but Mr. Doherty didn't give us a single shred of physical evidence that ties Randy Clooney to these deaths. Not one fingerprint, not one drop of blood. But there is physical evidence. A shirt covered in blood. The victim's blood and someone else's. But it is not Randy Clooney's blood. A DNA test proved that conclusively. The district attorney did not bring that DNA test into evidence. I only found that test by accident. Finally, there's Randy Clooney, a man, a rich man, with a trust fund that earns him an income of six million each year. You and I could live on that for the rest of our lives and still have money left over. And he gets it paid to him every year without having to lift a finger. So what does he do? Does he sit back and enjoy his good fortune? No. He gives every penny to his boys club. Then he works 50, 60, 70 hours a week for a salary that's less than 2% of his trust's annual income. Could you do that? Could you be that selfless, dedicated? Do you really believe that a man who could make that kind of a sacrifice could also murder 14 boys just for the pleasure of seeing them die? Neither do I. Why not? There's the sound effects of a cell door opening. The bed is stripped. Boxes are scattered around. Jill surveys the cell. Randy Emmett. Oh, Jill, what are you doing here? <laughs> well, what about you? I wasn't forced to live here in solitary confinement, contemplating my imminent doom. Doom, why'd you come back? Oh, uh, pack my things, haul them away. So why are you here? I wanted to see you. You can see me anytime. This, this is where I know you best. Yeah. We're on an equal footing. Out there, the noise, the media, it's overwhelming. Oh, yeah, here in this cell, you're still just plain old Jill Bennett and out there, you're a media star. <laughs> yeah, you to it. You went from non-profit attorney to one of the best known defense lawyers in the future. <coughs> I noticed. So, now you've seen me, what? I don't know. Not nothing, I guess. Good, then get to work. You can help me sort and back this stuff. We're sure to find things that belong to you too. Well, I'm only supposed to stay a minute. I, you, we're, we're not supposed to be here anymore. <laughs> All the more reason to get busy. That's a portfolio. Yeah, no, this is you, yours. Just drop it in that box over there. Uh, hey, 
This is all my stuff. I know. I started collecting it Sunday night. You were packing before closing arguments? I figured the outcome was in the bag. <laughs> all right, all right. I hoped the outcome was in the bag. You could have heard yourself. You won the case right there. Oh, hardly. You were brilliant. You sympathized with victims, empathized with families. You humanized me. <laughs> Greg Rossi called to offer me my old job back, <laughs> or rather, a better job. Oh, Jill, I mean, right now there isn't a job anywhere you couldn't get. Mm -hmm. But you're coming to work for me. It's it's too much money. A nonprofit shouldn't pay anyone four hundred thousand. The nonprofit year. gets its money from my trust fund. Don't worry, I'll make you earn every penny. <laughs> <laughs> now you're going to help me pack this stuff. Sure. Fine. Uh, grab those books um, by the bed. Uh, two uh, big books over by the desk. Mm -hmm. uh, those on the floor, they can go in that box near the door. <laughs> oh, they're heavy. Oh, let me help you. Here. The friend takes the books, the photo he hid earlier falls to the floor. Joe picks it up. What's this? Where did you it, get this? It's mine. Well, who's that with you? Nathan Jackson? Oh my God, it is. When was this taken? The dates on the photo. February 14th. Hmm. Valentine's Day two years ago. And you've got your arm around Nate Jackson, the victim. Nate wasn't the victim then. What? Nate. Nate didn't die that night. You didn't tell me this. Why? Is he, was he? Is Nathan Jackson the nice man you were protecting? Yes. You lied to me. No. I, I a just lie didn't. of omission is still a lie. The truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth, remember? You didn't just lie to me, Randy. You lied to everyone. Randy, did you kill those boys? How could you think that? Oh, it's so stupid. Look at this photo, Randy. Yeah, I've seen it. What, the way you look at him. You and Nate were, he was 17 years old and you were having sex with it him. It wasn't like that. Oh, yeah? Then what was it like, Randy? You have your arm around him. You're, you're looking at him the way a man looks at his lover. How can I fall for your act? Even after I discovered you lied about not knowing me, I just kept going. <gasps> so sure of myself. And now I set a pedophile free. Are you a serial killer too, Randy? Because did you go after those other boys, seduce them, kill them so they couldn't talk? Are you, are you going to kill more, Randy? Give me an idea of how many so I'll know how much blood I have on my hands. Oh, stop it. Just stop it. I'm not a pedophile. You just admitted you had sex with an underage boy. Look at that photograph. That photo was taken at my birthday party at the club 14 months before Nick died. Nobody had died when that photo was taken. Nobody. It, it didn't mean anything then. But it means something now. Do you think I lied to you? Or maybe I did. <laughs> I hit my relationship with Nick because of how it would make me look and here's the truth jill i didn't lie because i abused boys i dedicated my life to these boys i went on trial for my life because i'm a gay man who helps boys do you really think i could coldly kill those boys then why did you lie huh why come on randy give me give get me to trust you again i nearly quit when i caught you in your first lie Instead, I, I stupidly decided to believe in you anyway. I thought, this man's flawed, all right, but he's no killer. Oh, he made a mistake. But it wasn't a mistake, was it, Randy? It was all just part of your plan. Yes. And you figured 400,000 was enough. What? Yes? Yes. Joe, will you please listen? Well, I tell you the truth, the whole truth. I bear the, the responsibility for those deaths, but I did not commit a string of murders. I ended those murders and I paid a price. 
it'll haunt me as long as I live. Really? <sighs> have you ever fallen in love? No, well, I have. I fell hopelessly, impossibly in love. I was obsessed. I didn't think, couldn't think. Come on. A few months before that picture was taken, I met a beautiful young man in a bar, in a closet. I couldn't. I couldn't believe my luck when he talked to me, danced with me, went home with me, just turned 21, or oh, so I thought. Quickly in love with me, too. I became obsessed with him. I thought about him every minute. Started planning a life with him. So Nate was the nice Yeah, I was man. such a fool. It never occurred to me that the object of my affection was not who he said he was. And I saw him at my birthday party at the club. They called his name, brought him up for the presentation. He was one of my boys, a scholarship winner, one of my successes. And he was not yet 18. The picture? It was taken just before the presentation. All the hearts and flowers, very sweet, but what's the point of the story? Nate killed those boys. It was Nate's blood on Mark's shirt. You couldn't possibly no, know that. couldn't I? Well, I ended it that night right after the party. I took Nate aside and I told him it was over, that I couldn't, a man in my position couldn't love him anymore. Nate was furious. He told me I'd pay. I ignored him. <laughs> what could a 17 year old do? You to expect me? me to believe this? Yeah, I didn't believe it until Nate came to me one night. And I, w I wasn't going to let him in. But he, he was hurt, he was bloody. He said he'd been attacked. So I treated his wounds, gave him a clean shirt, and I sent him on his way. He pleaded to stay, pleaded for me to take him back, said, Crazy things I didn't believe. Later, I realized he'd come to me on November 14th. And all the boys... Right on the 14th. How convenient. I realized that I'd met all the murdered boys at least once. I, I talked to them casually, presented them with an award, scholarship, and, and soon after, they were dead. Nate set me up. Nate killed them. I knew I had to do something. Like call the police? If I called the police, do you think they would have believed me? <laughs> Arrested a 17-year-old boy, would they have tossed the old pedophile in jail? What, what would have happened to my clubs, my boys? Then, I had to find a way to stop him. You killed Nate? Come on, Randy. His body was found just like everyone else's. Because I put it there, I planned it that way. I studied the murders. I realized the boys were being killed in alphabetical order. After he killed Mark, I told Nathan that he could have what he wanted. I praised him told him how clever he was. I told him we'd go to South America and live on a beach, that we'd leave on March 14th, 15th. And on March 14th, I cooked a special bon voyage dinner, made love to him, and strangled him with a belt from my dressing gown while he slept. I drugged his wine. He wouldn't wake him. And I dressed him, drove him to the construction site, and left him there. You waited? You waited? You let three boys yes, die? Yes, yes, but I protected so many more. Oh. Waiting was the only thing I could do. Next step, oh. had to fit the pattern. I couldn't afford to oh. be caught. So you became judge, jury, and executioner? And I did. 
damn the cost. The cost for whom, Randy? You don't think I mourn for those boys? You don't think I ask God every day why it couldn't have been different? Well, what about me, Randy? Why'd you make me a part of it? Yeah, I didn't plan to. But when you left me alone with the evidence book. I never did. You did. Saturday morning, Greg Rossi called Ugh. tell you to drop the case or resign. You were gone for more than five minutes. Plenty of time to remove that Ugh. last page and staple it to something else. You did that? Mm. But that became the whole basis of my case. Everything I said, I did, was a lie. Oh, I've got to go to the judge. And tell him what? That I'm not guilty? Well, I'll tell him how you tampered with the evidence. I'll tell him how you confessed to killing Nate. I've already been tried for killing Nate. Double jeopardy, remember? I didn't kill 13 of the, those boys, and I didn't. Murder, Nathan, I uh, executed him for his crimes. I'm a damn hero, I should get a fucking parade. Then, uh, How could you explain waiting until after I was acquitted? Come forward. I don't know. You think he'd believe you? It's the truth. You signed a contract to work for me. 400,000 a year muggles the waters, isn't it? Look, Jill, you saved my life and I'm grateful. Come work for me. Take the money, enjoy the fame, make a good life for yourself. You deserve it. Why me? Why did you choose me? Because you're smart, tenacious, and a little naive. Because we had a past. And I could make you believe me. Because I could give you what you wanted. What do I want? Money, position, power. But not this way. It'll be all right, Jill. You'll see. It won't seem so terrible tomorrow. And before you know it, you'll see that I was right, that I did the only thing uh, I could do. No. I'm, I'm going to tell the guards to put this junk in the incinerator. I don't want it. Except for my photo of Nate. <laughs> Why? Because I loved him. That's the only photo ever taken of the two of us. I love you too, Jill. <laughs> See you at the office on Monday. Randy takes the photo and leaves. Jill is left staring at nothing. Back out, end of play. Very <laughs> <laughs> no so grimy, grimy. Yeah, yes. but he didn't do He's it. Pretty grimy. Well, that one time he did it. So, um, uh, very quickly, um, you can unmute yourselves, uh, folks, and turn your cameras on and all that good stuff uh, on the Zoom thing. I'm talking to the Zoom people now. Hell with you. Hi, I'm with them now. Hi everybody. <laughs> Uh, there's uh, Marge's cup. I'll do this so you can see the Zoom people. Great job. Really, really great job. My camera's on? Yeah. Oh, so fuck, fucking useless. Um, sorry, Randy would never say that. And take the background off. Yes, miss. <laughs> I always yeah. do what. Yeah, tells me, right? Yes. Okay, so start talking while I'm faffing about the this. Um, <laughs> no, do you want to run the session, Bill, or shall I? Uh, well, there's a four step process here. We're going to hear um, step one the things that jumped out at you at the, your first refresh meeting. Hopefully, they're most invaluable here. Uh, Secondly, we're going to ask Marjorie if she has any questions for you guys. Yeah, and okay. thirdly, and you guys, if you have any specific questions for Marjorie. And then we're going to go to um, the portion where you're going to ask Marjorie if she would like to hear further comments from you about the first part is 
your first impression, what jumped out at you while you were listening to a play? Popcorn, popcorn. Sometimes we call this pops or popcorn, or we go, <laughs> and it's usually positive. Marketing, that's all I like. I just, I want to be a dialogue marketing. That's all. So I'm waiting for section three. Say, say it again. I don't know if she heard you. I'm waiting, I, for, I couldn't. waiting for the third act. I'm waiting for, yeah. oh, You're waiting for the audience. third act? Uh, yeah. The third yeah. act. He's waiting yeah. to talk to you over a glass of wine, Marjorie. Yeah. No, ah. Okay. <laughs> also, when we're in the start, there's only one mic that's an echo and it's not, and it's up there. You do have to bring it. You could come so over. Come over and talk to it. I'll just get up and say something. Marjorie, it's Jeff. Uh, I really enjoyed the play. It's kept my interest. Thank you. Next. Other popcorns? You. Me. Uh, Marjorie. <laughs> um, Seriously. No, uh, Marjorie, the, uh, the characters are dynamic. Um, uh, they kind of uh, delved into both their uh, personal experiences um, from childhood on. I think it's a well-featured um, play. Thank you. They, they, they both seem like real people. Well, fleshed out. Right. Complicated, quite say. Mm -hmm. Next. All right, what section do? Well, I, if anybody else has anything to say about uh, their first impressions of the play. Yeah. You know, um, Mark, I'm wondering if you felt constrained about the number of characters you want to write in. I felt that uh, Jill's exposition about her relationship with her boss well, felt a little flat. I would have liked to see her and Greg to see okay. presenting the information that Joe was presenting herself. Hmm. Well, I'll speak about on the subject of exposition. I felt like, um, and it may be really common at least for the writers to say that. I felt like we we got a lot of exposition about the trial. Unfortunately, I know you're trying to write it here. Just holding you for one second. You carry on with that point, um, ladies and gentlemen. On the Zoom call, if you would turn on your closed captions, they seem to work very well at picking up what's being said. Carry on, please. In, in regard to exposition, I felt like a lot of there's a lot of exposition in the second act about the trial. Uh, with except of the speech later on, but um, it, and I know there's an attempt to keep it as standard here, but um, I felt a little like I was not getting what I could have. Uh, okay. Kind of okay. Um, Marjorie, you were saying Some of the, the, the traditional scenario is the good guys win you know, all the time, but the seems like ended with uh, Jill uh, and Burton and Clone for a devil's deal. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, in and now she has to find out how she's going to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yep. And uh, I mean, how many of us I got inadvertently got suckered into deals that didn't quite work out? Oy. Mm -hmm. I mean, we think we're so sophisticated and. Hands up, everyone. If you ever got sucked in by some devil. Okay, moving on. Um, <laughs> eating done here. Oh, no, finish your thought, John. Well, I was, 
I was going to say, uh, we think we're, we're so sophisticated and smart with it, but uh, I'm sure we've, we've all been uh, conned by in some way or another by people we probably trust. And that doesn't make us bad people or stupid people. No, no. Mm -mm. I think Randy Clooney thinks Jill is just stupid enough to fall for this. Well, That's my doesn't... feeling on his, on his, he is clearly a manipulative uh, man. Narcissist. Uh, it's certainly narcissistic and uh, possibly amoral. Um, but you don't get that from early on, anyway. I don't, know. I don't think stupid for it, right? I think he but thinks she and everybody else in the world is stupid enough to fall for his games. That's just my feeling as an actor. Well, he's written that way. He's written to be in, in command. And every scene, like, he's the one that pulls the string. Like, Randy mm. is in charge. Mm. Um, which, it's, you know, it's, a wonderful role as an actor to like be given of like I'm the one I'm the mastermind in the scene. Um, it's a lot of it's a lot to play. So it's like it's a great gift uh, to give to the two actors. Yes. Can I just say and then we'll take you two gentlemen. Um uh, when March first wrote this, when did you first write this March? Um I've wrote it, I've, I've worked on it for, oh, about six or seven years, and I finished it, um, my first draft, about ten years ago. So, oh, wow. it was a, it's been a long time. Right. Marge mm -hmm. and I had a discussion uh, about me uh, working on this as a, a, a dramaturg. So, I, I have done, uh, and because Marge has been sick and so on, um she hasn't really had a chance though you may have uh, had really a chance to see what uh, what i did with it as dramaturg so uh she'll she, i'm assuming march will either rewrite this or leave it be or take it back to earlier versions all of which exists of course so just to let you know where we are uh between, could you define the term dramaturge, please? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, very, that's a very good question. Dramaturge is a, is a theatrical, or a dramaturge, people call them, um, is, uh, I know, um, is a, a theatrical term of art, meaning somebody who doesn't necessarily write plays, who doesn't necessarily direct plays, who, uh, uh, but what I know, when I put it like that, it sounds so silly, but they work on a play with the playwright and often with the actors as collaborators to make sure that for example there is version control in the play and that the playwright is aware of how the play is now in in reality as opposed to in their head for example and marge will know this one writes a play and i'm a, I'm a playwright too and i'm a dramaturg sorry Turge, and um, I write a play, and I think that what you're hearing is what I originally envisaged. But because of changes, it's not. But I'm glossing over that. And it's the dramaturg, one of the dramaturg's many uh, jobs or tasks to keep you on the point. Does that answer your question? Well, I think so, yeah. Right. Yeah. Are we at the point where we're doing prescriptive things? No, that's, that's, we wait. that's the last thing, actually. Right now, Marge, uh, do you have any questions for us? Um, I have one or two. Uh, my first question is this. Was there any time during the course of the play that you were bored? My answer is no. Nope. Thank you, Jeff. No. John, no. Some of the build ups seem a little repetitive, sadly. I guess the whole thing, if I have a problem with it in a sense, 
Uh, you often play very close to the best of actors, so that they suffer a great deal of the set, suffer an enormous amount of the second. David Lawrence and Al Swinton. So, it also, I'm not sure it really seemed to weigh those mysteries sort of unfold a bit. The scene instead of being a big cascade of him. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah. I understand. Do you understand what he said, Marge? Um, not really, and you wouldn't want to read what it says in the closed captions. <laughs> uh -huh. Because they were, uh, well, right. you did not exactly get it right. For example, closed captions is giving me dramaturg as janitor. <laughs> Same thing. Same thing. Well, do you want to you know, like, come up here and just like, yeah, um, sorry. I I heard the beginning a little repetitive, and I and then it kind of went into nonsense words, unfortunately. Yes. Well, to sum up, do you mind if I sum up? Well, it's a great deal, sort of a big cascade of information at the end. Quite, you know, everything sort of very close to the best. It's always very close to the best attack, and it's a enormous cascade. Talking to the mic. So I feel it didn't quite unfold actually throughout somehow, but then okay. Seems like you're having a lot of fun. What do you mean by close to the vest, if I can ask that? Well, it was all very little about about the case itself. It was all the relationship between the two of them. I didn't. Uh, Really, to the end, I really didn't see if the DA had much of a case to begin with. I mean, I don't, the, DA, the evidence, there was no sense of the evidence being overwhelming because we didn't know very much about, about the case. Yeah. I, I don't know. I had an early thought oh, that, that the casing seemed awkward. And after hearing directly commentary, I am. Leading more in the direction of this is a table meeting, and not rehearsal directly or performance on the stage. So, if you're concerned about the boring aspect of it, I think that's a valid concern. But I think that is more in the direction rather than writing. Mm. Than you mean pacing, like about that. Yeah. yeah, pacing. Pacing, I think, needs to come from the direction mm -hmm. more. Your readers did a wonderful job. Um, mm -hmm. They knew that they knew what they were saying, and I was convinced that they knew what they were saying. And that's good. In table read, I think that's the best you could possibly ask for. Um, we were out of it, nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think uh, they did a terrific job, too. I'm interested in hearing where you thought it flagged from a script point of view rather than from a performance point of view, of course. And I thank you guys for your um, uh, for your comments. I have no. a second question, and that is, did you find anything confusing or unbelievable to I, have can to I, try? Can I answer both of those questions, please? Yes. Mark? Yes. Uh, as for the boring parts, um, most of the backstory that is done through monologues, uh, especially uh, Jill, I didn't think were necessary. The only thing that was necessary as far as being manipulative was him knowing and not telling her that he knew. The stuff about her family and Jack and all, pretty much all the rest of it was boring for me because it had nothing to do with the plot. It had nothing to do with him manipulating her. Uh, as for things that did not make sense, there's a couple of them. Uh, any defense attorney will not, will not, absolutely will not, 100% will not advocate for her client going on the stand. No, it does not Happen. And two, there's a spot in the 
when she's talking about DNA evidence, where she says that the DNA evidence did not come from Randy. And later on, Randy. Right. Later on, they said, she said that she made a point that they did not do any further DNA evidence on what they found. Mm. So that was an inconsistency. If they didn't do any DNA evidence, how could they know it was not Randy's? Mm. So that was just an inconsistency that, that I don't know. Mark? Can I, yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, can can I, you, and then you. Can I ask a question? Um, what what ideas, what themes, like what were you playing with? Can I, can I just interrupt? Uh, you? Sure. That's the next. One. Sure. So, I, I sorry. We're, sorry. 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 We're no. just no. answering. It's like yeah. Right. Yeah. We're just yeah. answering Marcus' question right now. If you have any questions about those themes and things? Yeah, that comes next. Right. No worries. Sure. sure. It, all right. Uh, okay, I'm going to tell you something useful now. <laughs> um, you asked for one thing I didn't believe. The one thing I didn't believe is at the very end when the photograph of the young man that Nate Jackson just falls out of the book, and that leads to the funny one. I don't think that works. For me, it would work much better if. If Randy wants her to see that photograph because he wants her to know at the end what happened. Oh, I thought that he did because he said, go over there and pick up your stuff. Yeah, but that's not clear enough. Um, she's got to say, Jill's got to say, you wanted me to know that, did you? Something like that. Um, so that she realized mm -hmm. he wants her to know. Mm -hmm. That would make more sense because it seems like it just happened as an accident. I see. And that's totally up to you. Thank you. So that's what I wanted to say. Okay. Fair enough. Can I make one more comment? Yeah, one more comment. Uh, I'm an addict of police procedurals and CIS. I get to I get it streaming and I watch it. I watch the episode maybe four or five times each. Um, and in murder mysteries, my perspective is that there's always just one person in the story who knows everything. Knows all the facts, all of the, the, the guilty, innocence, everything. That person knows everything. And the thing that, that caught me in my bias on that is there are so few characters in the story that I immediately identified Randy as the one character that mm. knew everything. Yeah. And as soon as Jill identified Nate in the picture, I knew that Randy was protecting Nate because Nate murdered the other boys. Oh, you so figured that out. I figured it came in the next song. Now, that's me. I'm not a whole audience. So take that with a grain of salt. But that that was my that was major impression on the whole week. That's that's very interesting. Most people it comes to them as a huge shock, but uh you have skills. Um my whole point in writing this and in having that twist at the end was to keep the play from seeing as though being predictable. If he were innocent of all the murders, it's predictable. If he's guilty of all the murders, it's predictable or people would think of it that way. So I looked for a third way. But my real reason for writing this play wasn't to write a mystery. It was to write a play that would make you think about how if you were alone with someone who was truly evil, as I believe Randy is, incredibly uh -huh. narcissistic, really evil, no matter how smart you are, how good you are, how strong your moral fiber, how long would it be before they could use what's good about you to take advantage of you and get you to do something you would never do? That's so what at the very beginning, you all said exactly what I wanted the play to be about. When we when you all said, okay, how many of you have been taken advantage of by somebody who was just a little smarter than you? And everybody raised their hands. 
That's where I was going for. Um, Thank you. Back, back story on this. My brother, brothers, George and Tom, both knew a serial killer, John oh. Wayne Gacy. Oh. Oh. Uh, my brother Tom worked with him. He uh, didn't work for the same company, but Gacy was a contractor, and he bought contracting supplies from my brother. My brother George was his guard while he was on trial. And when I talked to both of them about him, they said that the scariest thing about him was there was nothing scary at all. And my brother George said, if I didn't know he was on trial for this murder, if I hadn't heard him with his lawyers, if I hadn't seen evidence, he could have made me believe he was innocent. He said it was all, he said he was that good at telling you tales. And that mulled around in my head for a long time. And quite frankly, this play started out with five characters. Oh. And I kept narrowing it down because in order to tell that story, the story of being taken advantage, the story of wandering down that primrose path against your wishes and your best judgment, uh, I needed only two people. I couldn't have another person in there. Or at least I, I felt that way. May I ask a question, Marge? You certainly may. Um, in terms of the play right now, did the character of Randy Clooney make you feel that he was completely what he appeared to be, a man accused of this? And did he make you think that he was innocent and not smarter than you? Guys? Guys? Gentlemen, gentlemen in the back. Yeah. Would you mind going outside because it's, uh, thank you. Sorry. But uh, there'll be time afterwards if you want to go to a little bar around the corner. So uh, the question was, did the character of Randy Clooney make you think he was an awful person? Uh, or uh, did he seem kind of, uh, well, how did you feel about Randy Clooney? Well, I think that Eric and sure, but, oh, sorry. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I mean, sure, he was an arrogant jerk, but that doesn't necessarily make him a mass murderer. Yeah. Yeah? That's what I thought. <clears throat> and, I thought I, I, I found yeah, bring your chairs up. You, you what? No, I don't think you should take uh, Mark's portrayal anyway. Uh, uh, gave more color to me than just arrogant jerk. I mean, I, I saw the humanity there that we got. I think that there was, um, there, you know, his vulnerability only really is uh, divulged in one scene in particular, and I may have liked to see that um, again. Um, Which scene was that? Oh, uh, I'm scared. He, he legitimately it, when he said he was her, I'm, 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 right, I'm, I'm terrified. Did his crying, the the time when he broke down, was that convincing? Certainly, your tell was. In what? In your in no, your was he really from crying? I, I I felt I I was moved, and it was just it was I, I'm breaking down this wall. If someone is a billionaire or what have you, and like walls are built, right, like very intentionally and in the public eye so often that you know maybe you, you don't come across you okay. don't come across as, as confident in so many aspects of your life so he convinced you to, to, to put it simply anyone else I, I'm, I'm, I'm just naturally skeptical of rich people anyhow but i was i was certainly not convinced. well done <laughs> um, i i took him as he was i felt like he was a sympathetic and innocent character. Oh, thank oh, you. Wow. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, wow. I have a bridge. Oh. 
I, I want to discuss. <laughs> yeah, it's my favorite now. Narrows. <laughs> so, Mark. Sorry. He might have just simply had his own photos on his own. But he was young. Was he always the manipulator, or did he ever fool you into thinking, um, no, he really feels, he, he, he feels and uh, means those things, that he is professing to feel. So he felt that he was guilty for those people's deaths? No, That's just his reactions to it. He knew he wasn't guilty. Well, he, he loved the boy. He loved Nathan. Yeah, yeah. The the underage boy that he was having sex with and later murdered. Uh, yes, he loved him dearly. Well, so to consider, to consider yes, I know much, right? Uh, is uh, is he a narcissist? Yeah. And and oh yeah. Yeah, clearly. Uh, but did that come over early, or did he only persuade you of that later? No, I mean I knew that early on. But, uh, but if I may say something, I know, you know, quite a few gay people. And frankly, they're all angry, they're all arrogant, they're all narcissistic. It <laughs> doesn't mean they're all right. <laughs> just seem like a standard gay person. I will stop. I don't think this was, I don't think his personality and, and so on was to do with his sexuality. I think it was more to do with him being an amoral prick. Um, to use the word that I would never use in common usage, no. but so if we could, uh, let's move on to questions for Mark. So, mm -hmm. I'm kind of answering what I right. want to yeah. So, if it's with that in mind, if, if Mark, if your if your goal is to portray uh, the danger of you know dancing with the devil. Mm -hmm. I don't, uh, by the end of it, uh, Nate is much more monstrous than, than Randy is. Uh, you know, 13 murders, 13 premeditated murders, uh, as compared to one potentially justified uh, execution, you know, certainly internally justified. People do all kinds of like mental gymnastics to get there. Um, you know, but like in terms of if your goal is to, is to present the danger of, you know, this is what could happen if you dance with the devil. I don't know that you that you've gotten there. Right? Um, uh, you missed the point that uh, Randy allowed three other boys to be murdered to protect himself. He uh, he is an accessory. He he also killed those boys. He did, to wait did you for Nick's point? name wow. to come up. In the proper alphabetical order, three boys had to die. So you've got one crazy teenager who is a monster who's creating all of these things, and then you've got someone who should know better who allowed three boys to die so his plan would work and he would be safe. Sure, but like, you know, N is still I, I thought that was pretty damn monstrous. I, I'm just is, saying. Like, he doesn't necessarily have to do, like, he doesn't have to wait. From, from the jump, you know, if you have, you know, 14 deaths that all occur on the 14th, A, it feels like that's the end of the serial killer spree right from the jump. Mm -hmm. So if you have someone like, oh, Randy didn't do it. Well, like the serial killer's done, right? So there's there's less of a danger. It, as as the audience, as the you know general populace, so there's less of a danger now because the serial killer's uh -huh. done. The, they're done, you know, like the Zodiac killer is like still left undiscovered who that is, but they're not doing anything anymore. Yes. So if like 14 kids on the 14th, okay, if there's a theme that's associated with it, it's it doesn't matter that. Um, also, like if uh, uh, there's a there's an inconsistency in terms of if there are eight children that are all associated with the same organization that all go missing on the 14th at a certain point you know the other counselors are going to be like hey 
uh, look after each other on the 14th of the month, right? Um, so like cutting it early, and so it doesn't have to be, because it, it's still alphabetical, you know, because N is still after D, you don't, you don't need 14 decks, right? You can, you can get across a, a lot of the same, uh, you know, danger, and certainly there's actually more urgency if there is a, you know, the killer is still out there. Only eight children have, have been murdered so far. So my, may I ask a question, Marge, in, in this dialogue? Is yes. it that it's too convoluted to follow 14, this, the alphabet, and so on? Is, would that be an issue in the play? Well, I think Mark asked earlier on about inconsistencies and things you didn't believe. And I think that's one of these things. Uh, if there had been four and his mother would have been named Dave, it would still have the same impact if you, you know, Bill and Charlie died. Right. So, so if Dave was the third one to die. And no, no, no. If, if Dave was his lover and he got killed, he realized it. And for Andy and Bill got killed, he realized that David was going in order. Charlie was going to be next. He okay. Next, when Mark, when you ask about inconsistency, the, uh, David, you're asking about an inconsistency, but quite frankly, if you saw a pattern and it was, you know, all these boys are dying on the 14th. And they're in alphabetical order, and four die, and you put Randy in jail, and they stop. Right. What I'm You've saying, got Mark, the murderer. We hear you. When you already, the pattern is complete, or arguably complete, and they stop. Right. You may, yeah. have, you may have the murderer, and you may not. Right. But if, there, if it's, uh, there wouldn't be any additional urgency. Marge, one this moment. I did think about. I'm just saying there wouldn't be necessarily any additional urgency. Marge, just one moment. I'm just going to take off the microphone on uh, Michelle's computer and transfer the microphone to another okay. computer. Okay. So yeah. uh, grab coffee and a drink while I do can this. I it won't this take off? long. Can yes, please. You can leave. The meeting. Okay. There we are. So, um, are we? So, uh, let's we can move on to the next thing if we'd like. Uh, does anyone else have any questions for Mark about the play? I thought we were there. <laughs> it's just to say that you know, if if the goal is this is the danger of dancing with the devil, I, I don't think that you've it, you know it. The waters are muddy enough between Nate and. Uh, and can you make it? I'm sorry. Can you make it uh, a specific question? I, I I don't know that you like. You see that that's not a, a specific question. That's just a commentary, and, and I'll be happy. That's it. Thank hey. you. But there's room at the end for sure. your what you said. So thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Marge? I, I just wanted to reiterate what I what I was wondering about the number of characters. You did mention that you had five characters in an early version. Yes. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate how more satisfying I would have felt personally if the if Jill backstory were told <laughs> in, a, in, a, in, a, in a conversation with their boss. All right. And and that, that might that, have made clear, it would have been clear to me her motivations for not wanting to take the case. Thank you. And uh, anybody else have any other comment that Mark, you think Marge needs to hear so that she can make this play a little better or from or move this play forward from her perspective as she described. Not not from what the, what you'd like the play to be, she's described what she'd like it to be. And if you have any comments that you feel may help her move that along. And usually, may I, usually we say this, March, I have something to say about this. 
whatever it may be, in the play. Would you like to hear it? And Marge says yes, or, because she's in charge, she can say, no, fuck <laughs> you. Or, or she can just say, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so again, when okay. you do that, the more specific you are, the better. Uh, I had a question about Randy's speech to Jill when he was telling her this. That kind of specificity is what we're looking for, not just generally. I have a feeling, or I have a comment about how evil Randy is. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for very specific things that came up that you'd like Marge to hear so that she could further what she's described as her agenda with this play. And you should know you're on two cameras now. Yeah. I hope I made that pretty clear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can see I who you are now section and remember what it is you perhaps. say. About you you discussed um, initially having the play being how many characters? It oh, had I think um, it was five. 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 And it was now. Hello. <laughs> um so it was narrowed from five to two. I actually Upon started this reading and hearing yeah. the feedback. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Nothing you can do. I read only so many, so much lips. Uh, I, I speak only so much lip reading. Um, okay. So, um, right. So from, from five to two, after the feedback that you've received thus far, I'm curious if anything is um, resonating with you about building back any of the characters that you had before. No, this is a two-character so play. Going backwards, just a it's not you. It's the machinery and the idiot working it. Well, no, I mean, I, it was a question for Marge that I'm no, still... Um, yeah, the... Um, the no, I, I, I went back... Um, we can't hear you right now, Marge. Do you turn your speakers on? I don't know if um, speakers are off. Yes, they are, because we can't hear anything on the machine. We turned off the... Uh, the blip. Sorry, Marge, we'll be with you in oh, two seconds. Oh, sure. Okay. Go ahead, Mark. Anybody hear me now? Yes. No, reverb me. Who? Yeah, we'll do it. Okay. Like being in a Verizon commercial. <laughs> Can you hear me now? That's a creepy at all. <laughs> so the question was, Mark, after hearing the feedback, are you more or less inclined to include the three other characters that you've been talking? Yes. When I first started, it was a two-character play, and I got scared of it, and I added in that. And I added in Greg, and I added in uh, a narrator type person who spoke the news, so to speak. Okay, so that there was one one character who was the voice of the world around them, and uh, uh, like a reporter. And those were the people in the play. And I found. Lots of problems with it. So then I took them out. Then I had a chorus, like a Greek chorus, and I got rid of them. And I had all sorts of uh, different plots. And I finally went back to two characters. And I don't think I will ever change that. I might find another way to introduce exposition, or I might cut some things. But in my head, having tried lots of other characters, it works best with just two. That's what I think right now. Uh, somebody's speaking and I can't hear them.
this is what I get for not coughing COVID on you. <clears throat> you needed to get out of this. Um, I can hear you now. We need, we need the room, so we need to vacate the room and clean it. So, again, thank you very much, Marge. Yeah, thank, right. thank you, everybody. I really appreciate all your comments. I really do. <laughs> And uh, see you next month. See you next month. See you next month. Yay. Yes. 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 Yes.